Welcome to Spanish 312 uh, Hopscotch. It is a, a great pleasure today uh, to be speaking to Professor Daniel Balderston, who is a distinguished professor at the University of, of Pittsburgh, where he also uh, directs the Borges Center, is editor of probably the foremost journal dedicated to Borges, Variaciones uh, Borges, has written extensively, have a, a few of his books here, uh, Realidades y Simulacros, uh, Out of Context, and um, this amazing book, uh, How Borges Wrote, which is a study, amongst other things, of, of the manuscripts um, of, of, of Borges, the ones that uh, are available and some of which are not available uh, uh, to consult. So really, um, uh, Professor Balderston is, I think, ha has a claim to be the foremost authority on uh, the Argentine writer, Jorge Luis uh, Borges, and it's a delight to have you here and to be able to talk a little bit about about this book, uh, Labyrinths, which uh, exists only in translation. It's a collection from various different Borges books and has its own history, and we may talk about translation uh, at some point. But thank you very much, uh, uh, Dan. And, and I'll just start with the open question of how would you go about uh, approaching this book? Okay, obviously, Labyrinths is the book that introduces Borges to an uh, English-speaking audience, came out in 1962 from New Directions, the same year that Anthony Kerrigan published a translation of Ficciones uh, with Grove Press. Um, Labyrinths, I think, has had a longer life than, than that translation by Kerrigan because it tried to select important Borges texts of different kinds. So... Um, obviously an emphasis on the short stories, but also a very good selection of essays uh, and of the short uh, prose pieces that had just been published in 1960 in the book El Hacedor. And so Yeats and Irby included several of them, including the famous Borges and I, in this book. So it, it really launched Borges into the English-speaking world uh, at the same moment that he had uh, just been at the University of Texas the year before as a visiting professor, his first trip outside of the River Plate region since 1924. So all of the important texts that are collected here were written in Argentina, a few in Uruguay between 24 and uh, 61 when he went to Texas. In uh, he and Samuel Beckett won a prize, um, and then his first trip to London since of uh, an earlier a brief trip in 1924 with the fam with his family and his English grandmother, where they stopped in England as well as various other places during the second European trip. Um, so it's it's very much. At the moment that Borges is about to become a world figure, uh, he had al already um, uh, caused a bit of a sensation in France in intellectual circles, but in rather smaller ones. And I think that Labyrinth is important because it uh, brings a, a, a very intelligent selection of Borges texts uh, together. In, in a in a very usable form, um, the uh, original translations in 1962 were done mostly by the two editors, by James Irby and Donald Yates. They had both studied at Michigan with Enrique Anderson Embert. Um, uh, Irby did a dissertation called "The Structure of the Stories of Jorge Ruiz Borges," an excellent piece of writing that unfortunately he never published. Yates did a, a dissertation with Anderson Embert on Argentine crime fiction and published a, a fair amount on that later. Um, of the two, you know, I studied with Irby after having studied with Murillo at Berkeley. Um, and uh, Irby was a very, is a very wise man and a very fine translator, um, uh, extremely sensitive to nuance in Borges, so that I, I think his translations 
from all that long time ago, from uh, 61 years ago, uh, read fresh and read sound like Borges in English. He recreated Borges in English uh, in a wonderful way. So, uh, I, I, yeah. So, so as you're saying, this 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 book, this translation, and, and Borges is. Um, uh, impact on the on the English speaking world is it, quite late in Borges's career. In some ways, Borges is, had had been writing at least since the nineteen twenties. Many of these stories are from the nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, and he arrives in the nineteen sixties, and he sort of assimilated into a version of of uh, of postmodernism or ideas of postmodernism which were coming out then. Incidentally as you know better than I, his first translation into English was, I think, was in a science fiction uh, serial. So he could have come into English as a sort of genre writer, and he's interested in, in genre. He 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 becomes famous, has this amazing impact in, in the 60s. Do you think that that sort of framing of Borges as uh, in, in those terms, do you think that does justice to him? How do you think about the way in which he was received in, in the 60s, 20 years or so after many of these stories were written? Well, you know, it happened that way. I think uh, he had been, you know, he was profoundly interested in in science fiction and in crime fiction. Um, and one of his stories was translated uh, quite a bit earlier in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Um, uh, certainly a number of his texts either are crime fiction or are about crime fiction. So it was something that he, he was interested in. But maybe the the harder, more philosophical kinds of stories like Clunoparobus Tertius had to wait a bit um, to find a, an audience in France and then in England um, and in the United States. Uh, actually, United States before England, really. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is a collection that features a lot of those stories. Um, and, uh, so it doesn't, and, and by the way, Irby's afterward to the newer edition of it says that there, that they, that he's proud that they, uh, featured some of the more difficult, um, middle period stories over the, uh, the later stories dictated after the blindness uh, that were somewhat flatter and easier to read. Um, so I think that in that in that sense, they are attentive to a particular period in Borges's production. Um, I guess the period from 1939, Pierre Menard through. Um, the stories of the early 1950s and then the short prose. Uh, they also have, they also chose a number of essays from other inquisitions that came out as a book in 1952. Some of those essays are from the early 40s. And then the short prose, as we already said, uh, came out as a book in 1960. So it had just come out at the time that this anthology was put together. And of course, um... Uh, Borges, so, so he 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 becomes this uh, major international uh, figure, but he was always, to some extent, international. He he drew on um, the, many of the sources, innumerable sources. He he draws on for these um, for these stories um, include, and I know you you've written, I think, about um, uh, Stevenson or uh, influence on on Borges. He was interested in in the detective stories of G.K. Uh, Chesterton and so on. He had this uh, voracious appetite for reading, which which um, which knew very few bounds, and, and including high genres and and, and low genres, uh, which then he reworks uh, in, in many of these stories. I, I wonder if you could say a little about this kind of um, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, this sort of widespread and mixing of genres, and trying to take the take take crime fiction seriously, uh, and also to play with philosophy at the same time. Well, I think the the reason why he's interested in crime fiction is because of the intellectual puzzles, and so uh, 
the the basic structure of focusing uh, a narrative on the investigation of an event um, more than on the event itself, or in his variant on it, often the preparation of the crime in stories like Emma Soon's or for that matter, The Garden of Forking Paths, um, uh, are stories where the intellectual problem of how to construct a uh, uh, convincing narrative, um, the, the whole problem of verisimilitude rather than, rather than truth, um, uh, that's a reason why he's interested in that particular genre. I, I think, you know, with science fiction, of which which he explored somewhat less, but he did review a number of science fiction books, and uh, he certainly, you know, to learn of Barabistertius and uh, uh, a few other stories, and then some of the late stories are science fiction-y, um, uh, perhaps uh, in a freer form, I think he's um, less interested in the um, in that genre as a, as a whole. Um, but what's interesting, though, is is the ways in which he then crafts uh, stories, some of which pretend to be book reviews or pretend to be um, summaries of. Uh, novels or encyclopedias or other things uh, that manage to cross a lot of these genre boundaries um, and also cross the boundary, uh, transgress the boundary between the short story and the essay in a very dramatic way. Um, Adolfo Biocasares comments this, on this as early as 1940 in the introduction to uh, the anthology of fantastic literature, what's what was translated much later as the Book of Fantasy. Um, uh, he, he notes that Borges is, is writing a new kind of short story. Um, the mixing of the high and low and the local and the international, um, certainly something that he was interested in from the beginning of his career. Um, he uh, he always was interested in, you know, uh, strange bits of popular poetry. Uh, he has a wonderful essay in the late twenties about the inscriptions on on uh, carts on ox carts uh, in Buenos Aires. So the 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 carts that would collect junk um, uh, and the whimsical inscriptions on them. Uh, he uh, he certainly is interested in um, uh, local mythologies, but also in figuring out how to mix um, uh, his very wide reading um, uh, with, uh, with local concerns. Um, I have a fairly recent article on the manuscript of story. It's the continuation of a uh, sequel to the Jose Hernandez national poem, the Martin Fierro, in 1879, and he provides a an account of the death of the of the of the hero of the gaucho hero of of the Hernandez poem, but he manages to narrate it uh, very carefully using techniques from the Icelandic sagas of the 13th and 14th centuries. So there's an example of how. He was thinking uh, locally and acting globally, or maybe the other way around too. Both both things at once. Um, I think uh, you know Beatriz Sarlo quite rightly reproached the reception of Borges as only a cosmopolitan or an international figure. Um, the uh, the the fact is that when he when he constructs his uh, most local um, narratives, he's thinking um, in a much broader frame and vice versa. I think, uh, you know, even the early stories, which are not included in these anthologies of uh, 
Universal History of Infamy, 1935, those are mostly set elsewhere, but they were written for a cultural supplement of a mass daily newspaper uh, for the Saturday supplement. And they repeatedly call attention to the ways in which the story story of the Tichborn claimant or the story of um, the widow Ching, the Chinese pirate and so on are uh, worth retelling for an Argentine for a Buenos Aires audience. And so he was he was interested in bringing um, uh, together um, readers of all kinds with with texts from all over the world. I want to pick up on a, a couple of uh, of things that that you mentioned here. There's there's so much uh, obviously. So so one you mentioned a, a a little while ago about the difference between verisimilitude and truth. Um, and I wonder if you could uh, say a little bit more about that. I, I, I suspect that's one of Borges' um, uh, obsessions, I suppose, and, and, and how you see that playing out in some of these texts. Well, he certainly starts thinking about that very hard in 1931 and 32 in a couple of essays, The Postulation of Reality and Narrative Art and Magic. Um, which precede the writings of the writing of the stories of uh, Universal History of Infamy, with, that came out in 1935 as a book, and and uh, certainly the most important story there, uh, Hombre de Quina Rosada, or Street Corner Man, or Man on Pink Corner, is something that where the narrator of the story who turns out to be uh, the protagonist of it, although he doesn't look like it at the as you read the story, you only figure that out uh, on the second reading. Um, uh, that that notion of telling a story that's convincing uh, to the reader or the spectator, um, even though it's not true, uh, is something that he's also going to work on later in Emma Suns when she constructs a whole narrative about having been raped and killing Abraham Loventhal in um, to to defend herself um, when uh, he writes the story about the Irish um, Revolution, um, the the mark of the knife. I'm sorry, the the form of the sword, the shape of the sword, mixing up the. The, my article about it with the title of the story itself, La Forma Espada, The Shape of the Sword. Uh, in uh, in cases like that, he's clearly interested in, in how, in showing how a narrative can be constructed to be convincing, even though it's not true. This is an old distinction in, in law and in literature, um, but Borges takes a particular interest in it, and he's interested particularly in sort of subliminal clues, um, bits of information about absent causes or absent effects, uh, bits of information about the things that surround a given event um, and that make the reader work. He's very interested already in Tlun Oparobistertius in the first, in the opening of that in uh, how to construct a narrative where important things are left out and the reader has to work. Yes, this notion of the, I suppose, the active reader is is one of the ways that it, it's described. Um, the the reading is also the the reading is also uh, con- constructing the narrative. In other words, that the the the, the reader also plays a, a part in that. And the the text can be transformed depending on on how it is read. I, I don't know. Pierre Menard perhaps is is a good reason of that. A text which looks it looks banal at best. It looks it looks like nothing. It can be easily be overlooked. In fact, it is overlooked in the initial list of the of the of the text that this this uh, supposed symbolist poet uh, has has written. And, and Borges draws attention to the to the invisible work right of the of of, of Pierre Menard and and this copy of or, or recreation of the uh, of the Quixote um I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how 
or, or suggest to students, for instance, uh, what kinds of works they they might be expected to work they might be expected to do as they as they read this collection. Well, you know, I've said a number of times that it's a very important to read things several times, and perhaps to read through, but on a second reading to pay attention to the reference works that are available. And a lot of them are on the Borte Center website, the Finder's Guide and the Fishburne and Hughes Dictionary of Borte's are maybe the most useful for the, for the student reader who doesn't know whether or not the, the many names um, uh, and titles and places are real or not. Uh, that, that, that becomes cl clarified uh, with the reference works. And then to take another look and see what uh, what you've what you notice on the maybe the third reading. Um, uh, because uh, Borges conceals more than he shows. Um, a story like the Garden of Forking Paths, has all sorts of things happening under the surface that you only begin to notice uh, after you've read through it as a kind of whodunit, um, as the confession of Yutsu and the Chinese spy for Germany. But uh, why he's working um, for Germany, uh, who is chasing after him and uh, what are the some of the motivations of that person, of, of Richard Madden, an Irishman working for England? Um, what are the historical circumstances? Here we are in uh, 1916. The Battle of the Somme is about to begin, the bloodiest battle in world history. Uh, what are the, 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 the many uh, different strings of bits of narrative that are maybe not laid out, maybe not told as holes, but that come together uh, as you begin to pay attention to them. Um, I, th I, you know, they, they do, they are stories that repay uh, the, the rereader, the, the rereader um, learns a lot, not only about the text themselves, but also about how to read. Um, there are certainly uh, exercises in, um, in how to make sense of difficult um, problems, of enigmas. Um, and uh, so that I think some of that it happens as, the, as you reread. You, I, was, I was going to say you must be one of the most form that one of the foremost rereaders of of Borges. Perhaps that's that's one way uh, to put it. You you said we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, you, you you mentioned before we we started this recording uh, some of the things that Variaciones Borges uh, has been doing. It, it's a very accessible uh, website. There's so much uh, uh, there, and um, uh, I, maybe you want to say a little bit more about uh, uh, some of the things that, that you and, and other colleagues have, have been working on under the aegis of the, the Borges Center and so on. Well, one thing that's important is we published three books of facsimile editions of manuscripts, uh, a book of, of the poems and the short prose in 2018, um, a selection of manuscripts of essays in 2019, and a selection of, of manuscripts of short stories, including also the typescript of uh, Emma Soons in 2020. We're currently working on a book for 2024 of selections from his notebooks, which uh, were particularly, particularly the notebooks that are related to the talks and courses he gave after he overcame his fear of public speaking in 1949 and before he went blind for reading purposes in 1955. So during those six years, he was earning his living basically by giving talks and then eventually teaching courses. And uh, there are abundant notes, in very complex no reading notes um, 
that he then used uh, as he spoke. He, he very quickly, after beginning to do public speaking, he learned how to improvise talks and uh, was able to speak from his notes. And so the first time he was talking about something, he would do quite a lot of research about it, but the second or third time, things flowed more freely. And uh, this, you know, he had perhaps some inkling that he was going to go blind, but uh, had no idea how fast that was going to happen. But clearly, this is also the period of the sort of dress rehearsal for the talks and interviews, the, the many thousands of interviews that he gave after he went blind. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, uh, a lot of the quotations and the other materials that he collected for the talks in the early 50s uh, come to the fore as he um, gives cycles of, of lectures in Spanish, English, and French, and as he gives interviews in those three languages to a wide variety of interviewers. So one last question, uh, which is related to what you just uh, uh, were saying uh, there. And, and again, it re it's related to this book, the, the book on, on how Borges wrote, which is which is com completely fascinating. And, and the hunt that, that you, that is almost just merely implied that you had to uh, undertake to track down some of these uh, manuscripts or to get photocopies and, and so on and so forth. Um, what do we what do we learn? What do you say, just very briefly? What do, what do we learn from uh, looking at those uh, those the manuscripts themselves? Well, I think one of the th first things that strikes anybody who looks at the first draft is how uncertain Borges was about what he was doing. The texts, as published, look perfect, and yet he gets to them by writing a line and then writing above and below that line and scratching some things in the left margin and sometimes over the top of the page and then going on to the, you know, skipping a line and going to line three and continuing. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, enclosing in brackets and uh, setting with plus signs, setting, you know, up to maybe 15 possibilities for what would be a single sentence or a single word. Uh, so the, uh, the writing is, uh, the, the, the process of the writing is very free and very open. Um, he is looking to lay on the page as many possibilities as possible. And then it's only in the second or the third uh, versions that he selects from all those many possibilities. Uh, so one of the things it does is open the texts up to those other many possibilities. And of course, the story, The Garden of Forking Paths is about that, uh, about the ways in which different possibilities uh, exist in alternate um, frames of uh, time frames. Um, but also, uh, sometimes the manuscripts also tell us a lot about the particular things that he was reading at the time he was writing or that he consulted, uh, because often the manuscripts have a lot of bibliographical information in the left margin. So all sorts of, you know, hidden quotations, for instance, the man on the threshold, the story that's said in British India, um, he says at the beginning that it, it's, he's not going to have any interpolations from Kipling, but there is one. It's hidden, but it's there. Um, I don't think that I or anybody would have known that it was there if it hadn't been for the manuscript. It's just uh, one line of a Kipling poem, but it shows that he was looking hard at representations of India by English um Writing writers, Kipling was an Anglo Anglo Indian writer born in in uh, in the subcontinent, but but writing very much for an English audience about India. Um, so uh, that kind of thing um, leaps uh, out at the reader of the manuscripts. The the hidden allusions, the many possibilities, the uncertainty about exactly where he was going. Uh, and sometimes the 
there that that uncertainty is mixed with moments of certainty. There are passages in those same manuscripts that have lots and lots of rewriting and possibilities where then there will be a whole paragraph that is more or less intact and goes um, into the published version. So that he had some things that he was working out as he wrote, particularly beginnings and endings, and some things that were fairly clear to him as he was writing. Um, so if 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 he, he tells us that the reading always should be rereading, um, there's also something about rewriting as well, right? Working over oh, yeah. uh, uh, initial ideas. Well, we we've uh, we're out of time, um, uh, Dan. This has been uh, excellent, uh, very illuminating, uh, fantastic conversation. Thank you so much uh, for your time and and sharing some of your your expertise about Borges. Thanks very much, John. Uh, pleasure. Take care.